Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank, and I'm here with Stanley Forzik, also on our NIB board, here to talk to you today about today's infrastructure needs, and in particular, uh, recent developments that have affected uh, our understanding and um, uh, promotion of um, new infrastructure projects to beef up our electricity grid, among other things that we have to work on. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to get started. Um, I'm going to pull up a few slides. What we'd like to do today is to talk specifically about the infrastructure grid, but also in the context of what's happened recently with Hurricane Ida and the vulnerability of all of our infrastructure uh, to weather changes and other um, patterns that are uh, uh, making our infrastructure uh, today more vulnerable than ever. But we're going to start with electricity since it's so key. This basic uh, discussion will uh, go along the lines of a recent paper, that, a really great paper if you'd like to look it up, by the Council on Foreign Relations on how does the power grid work and then what are the implications for what we need to do. So to get started, uh, what is our electricity power grid across the United States? It's actually made up, it's uh, one of the largest, it's the largest machine in the world uh, that works uh, uh, great almost all of the time and we take it for granted, but we really need to make sure that it, it takes it, is, that it stays in tip top shape. Uh, it's comprised of over 7,000 power plants that uh, actually produce electricity from uh, coal, um, from uh, um, natural gas, uh, renewables and nuclear power, uh, 3,300 utility companies um, uh, organize that and through and send power through 2.7 million lines, uh, miles of power lines that go across the country. These companies can be either private companies, local uh, electric cooperatives, or even the federal government, which owns the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, power generation is sort of divided into three parts. The first are the generators that produce power from fossil fuels or nuclear or renewables. Then uh, they send that along high voltage transmission lines over long distances that carry um, power uh, to local areas. They, that, those transmission uh, facilities operate within three uh, geographic areas or they're called interconnections. The first is the Eastern uh, interconnection, the Western interconnection, those two meet at the Mississippi River and the Texas interconnection, which is a, a grid unto itself that's not connected to the other two. And then finally, uh, uh, distribution lines step down that high voltage and deliver it to uh, nearby homes and businesses. Now, the electric grid requires a lot of national oversight and money to make sure that it keeps on operating efficiently. Transmission lines are natural monopolies uh, that uh, provide a critical economic and public good to all Americans. They must be reliable and justify their rate increases so that they're not, uh, so that our rates, our electricity rates are not subject to say price gouging from the monopolies. The Department of Energy uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC uh, is the primary, has primary control over the generation and transmission lines and states and munis uh, oversee distribution. Uh, we've had complete deregulation. Uh, we started out with complete deregulation on our power grid. And then when we had several power disruptions, uh, that's where the power grid came under federal regulation. Then we tried to deregulate again, principally in the states of California and Texas. That was meant to increase efficiencies and lower costs, but it didn't, it didn't happen that way. Actually, costs went up and we've had some spectacular uh, transmission failures in, in those two states. So uh, the bottom line here is that uh, we need to regulate and have national oversight and any government policy that comes along, uh, like addressing climate change, must not only provide new regulations, but also must provide the money and the financing to make sure that those uh, regulatory requirements can be met. The next uh, thing we need to think about are what are today's vulnerabilities in our power grid? Uh, the, uh, the grid is absolutely vulnerable to extreme weather events, cyber attacks, and problems whenever we have peak demand that may overload our system. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates 
that we need $200 billion over 10 years just to repair and strengthen our electric grid. However, the bipartisan bill that is our new infrastructure bill, uh, spending bill will provide only $73 billion for new lines in cybersecurity. So uh, what the uh, engineers, civil engineers tell us is that most of our power outages occur at the distribution end. And we've really seen that uh, effect uh, that uh, happen in the latest hur hurricane that we've had, Hurricane Ida, which touched down uh, southwest of New Orleans and has destroyed uh, distribution power lines and put a million customers out of power and we likely won't have power uh, restored for many weeks to come. So that's uh, an example of where we've had uh, past storm repairs, past damages. Uh, that area suffered storm damage from Hurricane Katrina several years ago, had repairs done, but apparently there was not enough resilience uh, done, even though it did, uh, uh, the New Orleans area did have new levees put in place that held the, uh, the electric distribution grid did not hold uh, with the hurricane. So um, now we have a new wrinkle uh, in our electric grid, and that is that we're going to add on much more renewable energy. We are expected to double generation from renewable energy over the next 30 years, uh, and that's going to affect how the grid will operate. Uh, one problem for the grid is that the variability of wind and solar makes providing uh, steady power more difficult. So for that, we're going to need smart, uh, a smart grid and elect electric uh, new, new technology so that we can uh, keep on delivering wind and solar when it's available and then store it up and then provide it to customers as they demand it. Uh, another aspect is that utilities are now worried about uh, distributed generation, which is generation that uh, is done at the end user source and goes, uh, for example, um, solar panels on house uh, roof houses that provide uh, um, solar uh, electric power to the house, uh, and then even push back uh, energy into the grid when they have more than they need. Uh, this is going to uh, affect uh, adversely affect the financial stability of the utilities because it means that they'll either lose customers or revenue over time, and they'll still be, need to be making their investments in transmission and distribution facilities uh, from which the uh, distributor will benefit, but uh, will not be paying for the investments in those things. So that means that there might be a little pushback from the utilities in, going, in moving to renewables. They may charge uh, customers more um, for providing um, for accepting re renewable generated energy. Uh, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. Now, governments have not yet, in my view, taken a uh, total account of the total funding needs that we need for uh, moving into renewables. For example, a Department of, of Energy study found that if we want to move 100% of all um, vehicular traffic, that is both trucks and cars onto uh, the electric grid, and, uh, and then produce electricity from renewable power only, that's going to require an investment of some $3 trillion. And then the question is, uh, will, the, uh, the, will the utilities won't be able to cover that project, uh, that much money, but will the federal government's budget uh, come, come up with the money to cover it? Our National Infrastructure Bank uh, proposal, which we're proposing, will finance uh, all 200 billion that the engineers say is required to uh, fix new transmission lines, provide resilience, uh, prov uh, provide cybersecurity um, uh, checks on the um, software for the, that runs the grid. And then in addition, we'll be able to provide $80 billion for a high speed uh, voltage indirect current uh, transmission line uh, grid overlay. And the reason that this is, this is a really great idea is that states like New Mexico, which are one of the uh, best states to provide, to, to spin out um, so both wind and uh, solar energy are now constrained by the fact that they can't get their uh, electricity onto the electric grid. This uh, high voltage overlay will be able to take electricity from New Mexico, run it all the way across the country, across the two big the eastern and western grids, and deliver it, say, to an end user in Atlanta, Georgia. Really, it's a really great idea. So uh, the uh, 
the bill that we're proposing in Congress right now, and Stan is going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, other, what other kinds of things this bill can cover, but it, it will, uh, uh, H.R. 3339 will, provide, will create a bank that provides financing of up to $5 trillion to cover all of our infrastructure needs that are not currently being met by either the federal budget or state and local budgets. And that will be all of the funding gap that has been identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers in 16 categories. And in addition, other mega projects uh, 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 relating to affordable housing, a complete high-speed rail system across the United States, and large mega water distribution projects. But in the electricity sphere, the things that the bank will fully fund are the complete needs that the engineer, civil engineers say are needed for the electric grid and this, this extra $80 billion for a high, a high voltage direct current grid overlay to deliver renewable energy. So uh, I, uh, we're asking for you uh, to support uh, and call your members of Congress on HR 3339. It's a bill that will totally top up all, whatever bipart the bipartisan bill is able to finally pass as an infrastructure spending plan, that won't be enough. And this bill will provide all of it without adding to deficit spending, without requiring any new federal taxes and operating just like a bank, uh, like the banks that we've had in our nation's past. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stan and then he'll tell you a little bit more about electricity grid needs and resiliency problems all along the infrastructure um, lines. Stan? Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about uh, our power needs, our power infrastructure. Usually I talk about uh, transportation and, and different uh, infrastructure dealing with that, but I also have a great deal of expertise within the energy uh, sector. Uh, I am considered an expert witness on utility rate design in 10 states. I've given expert testimony before the FERC, the NERC, and four uh, PUCs within the Eastern region. Uh, what I wanna really talk about is sort of mix together some of the issues that Alpheca mentioned with the storms that we have and how it affects the power infrastructure and where the power infrastructure is going, but it's taking a lot longer than the way we perceive it should. Let me talk about the power grid first. The power grid is actually two separate systems. One is a system of distribution. That's what comes into everyone's home, every business that's out there. The local utility company is considered a LDC. That's a local distribution company. It receives power from a higher source, and I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. It does not generate power, it only distributes power. Now, we know that that infrastructure is getting old, but it's not as old as the rest of the infrastructure. Your rates that you pay for at home, your rates that you pay for in your business contain a certain percentage within its rate for expansion policies. Those stockholder entities, the LDCs, have already gotten enough money to make the expansion, to add resiliency and other things. So when we talk about the power distribution system, it's not that section. So the LDCs are fine. Now let's talk about the rest of the grid, we'll call it. The grid is not a United States grid. It's a North American grid, all right? It is made up of about 10 RTOs or regional transmission organizations, two of which are in Canada. The Canadian ones generate hydropower to a great extent. That power is sent throughout Canada and is also sent via DC links into the United States to Boston, Massachusetts, to Long Island, to New York City. So everything is regulated by those RTOs. The RTOs are regulated by NERC, which is a North American Electrical Liability Organization, and the FERC. 
The FERC controls a lot of issues dealing with the monies associated with the infrastructure. NERC handles reliability. So we have all of those organizations. Underneath those organizations is, ex uh, is exactly what Al Becca pointed out. They're responsible for generation. They're responsible for transmission. They're responsible for the high voltage uh, substations that deliver the power to the local distribution companies. What condition are they in? We've seen that there have been storms where power has been knocked out. Now, it may be a combination of the event. Very rarely is it the issue of the infrastructure unless the storm or whatever have you has knocked things over. Then shorts are created and it backs all the way up to the generator. The generator's power gets lowered and nothing comes out anymore. But that is a problem, not of infrastructure, but out of the event. Generation has been so slowly being lowered because A, nobody wants nuclear plants and a bulk of the power was being developed by nuclear pan, uh, plants. B, it doesn't want fossil fuel plants. For some odd reason, we want to move away from all those things. So we are going to become, unless we do something about it, capacity short. Because all we're going to rely on is a few peak shaving gas units and renewable energy. Let's talk about renewable energy for a moment. Let's talk about solar power. To produce five megawatts of power, you need five acres of land. Five acres, five megawatts. A city like Philadelphia, one city, needs anywhere from 150 to 200 megawatts of power. Five acres equals five megawatts. Think about how many acres of land we are going to need to put all of that solar power up there. Just think about that because there's a lot more cities than Philadelphia, New York, Atlanta, Chicago, they're all the same. The coalition favors nuclear power because nuclear power will give you the biggest bang for the buck. So we, we like the idea of keeping nuclear power, but we're impartial. If the, if the United States wants to go from um, nuclear power to renewable power, that's fine. Remember I said a lot of power comes from Canada, hydropower, all right? That hydropower is renewable energy because the water just keeps on flowing. Let's talk about wind power now. Wind power, whether it's in the ocean or on the side of a mountain, each one of those stalks with the fans generates anywhere from seven to 10 megawatts of power. City of Philadelphia uses 150 to 200 megawatts of power. If you're producing 10 megawatts per uh, 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 windmill, you need about 20 windmills, windmills just to do the city of Philadelphia. That's it, 20, all right? How many cities are the size of Philadelphia or larger? That's a lot of wind power, all right? This is the way we're going. The grids are not there yet. They're not gonna be there for quite some time, all right? I can tell you right now, the windmills that are being built off the shore of New Jersey, they're just staging things now. They're building the staging locations to build those locations. It's going to be a while. Again, we have to think about where we're going. I just mentioned we were capacity short. Alfeca mentioned, mentioned to you that we are transmission short. Transmission can be fixed very rapidly. That's not really a problem. If you drive down the highway and you see the high voltage towers, Look at them very closely. You'll see that there's about six or nine arms on them. 
all holding uh, transmission lines anywhere from 250 to 500 megawatts, uh, excuse me, 500 uh, kV kilovolts traveling uh, uh, along those uh, along the highways or wherever they go. When you look at them a little closer, you'll see that only about three or four are being used. The rest of the arms are vacant. There's no lines there. It'd be very easy to fix a congestion problem for transmission because all you're really going to do is run an additional line or two. The infrastructure exists. All we're talking about is adding the wire. So that's not that hard. The third thing we need to talk about insofar as power distribution is concerned is resiliency and the control uh, by the folks who move the power back and forth. Power is being moved everywhere. All right. If you were to go out to, I'll, I'll pick PJM is one of the ISOs. It's it's was the first ISO created. I was one of the stakeholders in creating that ISO back in the mid nineties. And it's one of the best. It goes from New York City to Richmond, Virginia, Philadelphia, out to Chicago. So it's taking, it, it produces a lot of power and delivers it to all of the local distribution companies or utilities. The issue is they control things at different control centers where they actually watch the megawatts flow back and forth and they can divert and move around if there is a problem with a certain transmission line, or even if it's two poles, they can divert power and come in from a different direction because everything is double redundant. Not redundant, it's double redundant. So you're always picking up when something goes on. Now those systems have been hacked and they're gonna to continue to be hacked just like the meat packing companies down in, in uh, uh, the mid-Atlantic region, just like the water distribution companies in Florida, just like everything else we have. Everything is gonna be hacked because we are at war with other folks. This is not coming from within the United States. This is coming from outside the United States. Those figures alone are in the billions of dollars to get everyone up to speed so that hackers cannot get in. So the power grids are important, not just for producing power or moving power around or making sure that your alarm goes off in the morning. They're there for the populace because everything runs off of it. Another interesting thing that is occurring, and I, I learned this earlier in the summer because I've been assigned a task with one of my clients to look at master planning for uh, bus transitioning from diesel to electricity. That is gonna have a direct effect on generation within the grid. It's also gonna have a direct effect on transmission, more generation than transmission. Imagine this, New York City is asking for, for a master plan for bus transitioning. They have 5,500 buses. 5,500 buses need to travel the streets of New York. They have to be recharged twice. Think about the power that that is going to be used. And there's only one utility company. That's Con Edison in the city of New York. So there's, they're all going to be done twice a day. That's a lot of power that no one has planned for. And it's not just New York. Connecticut is doing the same thing. San Diego is doing the same thing. There are 25 different cities that are doing that. And I will tell you, and uh, uh, the RTOs and NERC are very concerned about where people are going, and they're not telling the grids what's going to be needed. No one is speaking to them. No one is saying my master plan calls for me to need an additional 100 megawatts of power on a daily basis. But I'm going to go ahead and plan them and I'm going to order the equipment and I'm going to have the buses ready. And it takes six years to do it, but no one's telling people who work the grid. 
And that's going to be a problem. So I think what I'm trying to say is there are significant issues in dealing with the power grids that are out there. We can always get more power from Canada. They're willing to send power across DC lines and bring it into the country. The question is, is can we move it from where it comes in the country to where it's needed? And that's a that's a, a big concern. So let's let's sum up here. We have issues with EVs because we want cars to run on electricity. We want buses to run on electricity. There are commuter railroads that want to want to get started and move forward. And are we going to make them diesel? If we're changing the, the complexion of the United States to be green or sustainable, do we want to use diesel locomotives or do we want to use electric locomotives? So all of these things compound the issue of the power grid, not to even mention an occasional hurricane or a storm or a tornado in certain places. They all have an effect. And these things that I'm talking about have an even greater effect because they're not going to affect us today. They're not going to affect us in 2022 or 23, but they will affect us in 2030, 40, and 50. And if we don't get the right kind of plans in place, and if we don't get money to fix all of these things, then we're really going to have problems. If we can't fix the power grids, how are we going to order buses that run on electricity? Who's going to stop Tesla from building electric cars? Because we really don't have any way to charge them except at your own house. So the question is, is how are we going to do this? Alfeca has outlined the difference between what the bank can do and what the existing bill that's in front of Congress can do. And you've seen the figures. And whether you look on the right-hand side of her chart or the left-hand side of her chart, the figures tend, after you think about them deeply, because you know it's going to cost more than $5 trillion. I, I don't think we've talked to a politician who was on the ball who didn't admit the fact that even $5 trillion is too low. So we know we need more money than that, but we're arguing internally within the Beltway about $550 billion, which is not really going to do too much. It's not going to fix the water. It's not going to fix the electric grid. It's not going to fix all the highways. It's actually just enough money so all of the design engineers can stay in business. That, that's about it. The only amount, only people who are going to get anything out of $550 billion is the design engineers. It is not going to be the local folks who live in their homes. It's not going to be the states that really need it because they need broadband and they need new water and they need water. Uh, uh, they, they need large water projects. We're not talking about, when you talk about New Mexico or you talk about Arizona and you talk about those states, they're not talking, they're not really worried about the water distribution system. They're worried about, are their aquifers filled so they can grow crops so the rest of us can eat? But we're going to look at $550 billion so the design engineers and those people that want to develop these things can do something. What we're talking about is a national infrastructure bank that can do everything. And if we only get it for $5 trillion, we're not putting in a term, we're gonna to look to renew that 5 trillion for the next 5 trillion. So it's not going to end like other banks did uh, along the way in our history. Last one was 1957. And that's why we have, we're, we're in the shape we're in right now. We can't get too much done. With that, I will leave you to think about all of these things. Think about water. Think about power distribution. Think about everything that's out there that really needs to be done. And no one's doing anything about it. 
if you look in some of the trade magazines, you will see the articles from the design engineers saying that they're willing to move forward to get things done. We don't want that because then what you're talking about is a public-private partnership that is actually going to cost more and you're going to lose control. And the only people who are going to make money on that after you pay the bills is going to be the design engineers who are going to move on to the next project. I hope I enlightened you a little bit. Uh, always feel free to call out Becca or myself. We're interested in your thoughts. We want to hear from you. We will help you address any comments or questions that you want. So have a nice day.